critical category. Okay. My guest today is Professor Julie Adams, who's Professor of Computer Science at Oregon State University. Her research interests include human machine teaming and human interaction with unmanned systems. Welcome, Julie. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So um, I want to start with one of your papers, uh, SARTA, a supervisory based adaptive human robot teaming architecture. Uh, so you say here supervisory based human robot teams are deployed in various dynamic and extreme environments, for example, space exploration. Uh, achieving high task performance in such environments is critical as a mistake may lead to significant monetary loss or human injury. Task performance may be augmented, you say, by adapting the supervisory interfaces interactions for autonomy levels based on the human supervisor's workload level as mm -hmm. workload is related to task performance. Yeah, I found this very interesting, uh, Julie. I, I have done some work uh, in this area in, the, in a business context. Uh, so, so we have decision makers in business and they, they tend to make all decisions at the human level and increasingly we have now artificial intelligence uh, creeping into business decision making last 20, 25 years now. Mm -hmm. And so there is a question of what would balance uh, and optimality uh, between humans and autonomous agents who can help make decisions. Uh, but here we're we are talking about physical systems, aren't we? We were talking about robots yes. running around and then humans sort of supervising them, right? So, so, how, so, so what, what do you find in this paper? So this particular paper focuses on, like you said, supervisory interaction with a robot. And what we mean by that is that the human is not co-located with the robot. The human is likely very far away uh, from where the robot is being deployed. Um, so these are like the drones, for example? Drones is one example. Uh, ground robots could be another. Uh, marine robots, like underwater autonomous vehicles or uh, surface vehicles are also an example, right? These are vehicles that would need to have a fairly high level of autonomy, but also require human supervision and human interaction. And that is typically done from a position where the human is perhaps in a control room, in the case of marine vehicles, perhaps on a boat, um, in the case of something like unmanned aerial vehicles, if it's uh, like delivery drones, then you probably have a control room context uh, similar to like air traffic control, but for drones. So in these contexts, you want to be able to have the system understand what the human's current workload is in order for it to adapt perhaps how it's interacting with the human or uh, adapt its actions. Um, we tend to most frequently think about teams of robots in this context. So the human is supervising multiple uh, vehicles. It could be a, a combination of aerial ground or aerial marine vehicles, for example, or it could just be different types of aerial or ground vehicles, for example. And Oftentimes we look at things like disaster response. So wildland fires that are very uh, intense for the humans to pay attention to, they're stressful. Um, in addition to requiring potentially a lot of interaction supervisory uh, capabilities from the human. And what we use are uh, physiological monitoring of where, using wearable sensors in order for the robot to gather information about the human's current state um, to estimate the human's workload and how it should respond. And when I say workload, we're talking about overall workload. Typically in the human factors literature, workload will equate to cognitive workload. Um, so the things that we're thinking about, et cetera. However, in our case, we tend to think of workload as cognitive, uh, physical workload, which can be decomposed into gross motor, fine motor, and tactile interactions speech workload, visual workload, and auditory workload. And understanding those different components and, and the human's current state with regard to those different components allows the robot to identify how best to adapt um, mm. to the human state. So for example, if the human is currently um, 
trying to maintain a position of the vehicle using a joystick, so that's a tactile interaction, while focusing visually on the screen, then trying to provide the human with some information visually is not going to be successful by the mm -hmm. robot, right? Perhaps it should provide it in an auditory manner or should decide to perhaps help the human control the vehicle's position as opposed to uh, having the human do the entire control. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. So, so, so you 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 are going in the other direction. What I was so the, the robot can have a feel for what's the probability mm -hmm. of better instruction coming that's from right. the limited capacity of a human. Yes. In four channels that you have, or five channels that you describe here: cognitive, physical, visual, auditory, and speech. Um, and hence make uh, appropriate adjustments to those instructions, so to speak? Yes, yes, that's correct. So what we really want to move towards is actually having peer-based teams where the human is co-located with the robots in an, in an unstructured outdoor environment, such as wilderness fire response or some other disaster response, in which case um, we can't rely on things like cameras in the environment to help us understand what the human is doing and what their workload is. Um, so we try to use these wearable sensors in order to identify uh, the workload. What this paper assumes that you're referring to is that we know what the tasks are that the human is doing. However, we have current work that has actually been investigating how can we also use these sensors and some additional sensors to identify the human's current task in order to estimate workload because we can't always assume the human is going to do the tasks in the same way. It depends on the human as well. Um, yes, it does. For it fortunately does. or unfortunately, we are not uh, completely the same <laughs> or 8 billion of us. Uh, and then so so there is a sort of a customization. So, so, so what do you think about the robot having some sort of a learning experience yes. over time of the, the yeah? That is exactly what we assume. So we tend to focus on environments and domains in which we expect that the human and robots will be able to train together so that over time, not only does the human gain an understanding of the capability of the robots, but the robots are also learning from the human. Now, while we have demonstrated in other work um, that is not in the papers that I sent you, that um, our current capabilities for estimating workload do generalize over the human robot relationship types as well as domains and tasks. Um, we do expect that we can develop individualized models and we've shown this um, for helping the robot understand a particular human. Now, when you work with disaster responders, one of the first things they will tell you is that every disaster is different. And so while they train on some of the common elements they always are adapting to the current situation. So that training is something where the robots can train with the humans in order to do that learning that you're talking about and get that customization. One of the things that we've, we're working on is how do we do that continuous learning and adaptation, right? Uh, for example, if we are injured or perhaps carrying a heavier load, then that might change the way we do certain tasks. Um, as we know, when we age, right, um, we actually change the ways that we do certain things uh, to adapt based upon restrictions we may have. Um, similarly, cognitive uh, decrements that can occur with increased stress, et cetera. So we do want the robots in the future to be able to adapt to those circumstances. They aren't able to do that right now. Um, we are also starting work that will allow us to identify uh, workload for previously unseen tasks. Um, and how we can identify that, especially in some of these um, sparser situations when you have to adapt to a disaster. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. So, so adaptive learning. So uh, since a robot is uh, collecting a lot of information over time, it could uh, get to a position to say this human is pretty good in the morning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe in the afternoon, you know, uh, after uh, maybe a heavy meal or something not that efficient. So, so that kind of heuristics could be developed at the robot level, I would imagine, right? Yes, that is correct. So 
Um, the, the robot, you know, we, we use a lot of uh, learning, different types of learning. So you have to use different types of learning based upon um, the, the metrics that you're using, um, as well as the data points that you have. But we use different learning approaches to allow that robot to understand um, how things can, or we will be using, sorry, we don't do this right now, we don't adapt that way right now to the individual differences over the course of the day, but that's something we're working on. Um, we'll be able to adapt to those things over time. And I was thinking, Julie, I don't know if this is really necessary or relevant, but given that we just have conventional computers today, not quantum computing, uh, the robots are somewhat limited too in some ways, right? right? So that the human, uh, this could be a bi-directional flow of information here that, that the human could also sense how efficient and effective the robot is in that environment? Yep, that's absolutely true. And, you know, there tends to be an assumption in robotics that um, robots can keep all the information in memory, which is not true at all. <laughs> um, in fact, we have prior publications, one of my prior students from Vanderbilt University on uh, forgetting. So trying to mimic human forgetting over time in order to increase the robot's capabilities, which would be relevant here. But, um, you know, there is limitations, especially if you're talking about smaller, uh, less expensive robots, um, you know, that aren't going to have quantum computing and aren't going to have, you know, uh, some supercomputer available to them. Um, so that is a limitation that has to be considered and, you know, the, you have to learn these models ahead of time using more, uh, you know, perhaps offline learning after the training in order to improve the capabilities and then limit uh, what can be learned in real time right now because of the processing capabilities available. Mm. Uh, there's a network effects. I know that we're going to talk more about this in the, in the next, uh, next piece. But there's a network effect too, right? So it, 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 often it's not a single robot; it's a it's a swarm or or a group of robots that that they're yes. talking about. Yes. Right? So for this work, um, most of our work thus far has focused on the uh, single human, single robot. However, we are planning an experiment for in, that will occur this summer. That will be a single human, multiple robot in a. Um, in a co-located situation. So something like doing mass casualty triage, for example. Um, so in that case, you do have networking and communication that does have to go on. And if you were talking about doing that in um, certain circumstances where you could assume that you have cellular connection, you can assume that you have the connectivity to do that. However, in other circumstances like wildland fires, you're often in remote areas where there is no communication uh, network, if you will. Um, right, you're not going to have cellular coverage up in the Cascade Mountains um, in a remote area. So then you have to kind of, you're not also not going to set up a Wi-Fi network. <laughs> it's just not going to be effective. Um, and you can't carry around your own LTE base station um, to create communications. So um, you have to be nimble and quick in those circumstances. So you are probably relying on something more like um, perception-based communications or um, direct communications um, than some sort of network uh, communications. Yeah. Um, I, I was thinking, Julie, that it has applications in a lot of different areas. So for example, financial markets, uh, mm -hmm. we can show that um, a, a human doing it by himself or herself is not very efficient. That's right. A ro robot doing it by itself is not very So we have an inverted U type relationship where we can optimize in the middle mm -hmm. that a, some sort of a human robot uh, combination appears to do right. a lot better, right? So the, uh, the, the idea here could have a lot of applications in other, other, other fields, perhaps. That's very true. And in fact, um, some of my work I did before I came back to academia, Eastman Kodak Company was exactly this type of thing. Um, so the machines that um, produce the motion picture film base and x-ray film base are very complex. Um, and we were actually developing a decision support agent to help the operators in different contexts to A, provide them with information, but also ensure that they were verifying 
um, certain decisions. So to provide kind of this cognitive uh, assistance to them. Now, in that particular case, the um, out, the agent was not adapting what the system was doing, but was really more to help the human in that context and, and help them make better decisions. And so that kind of carries forward here because ultimately, how do you improve the proficiency of the team and their overall performance? You have to provide them with appropriate um, information and decision support, both the robots and the humans. Yeah, and I was also thinking, you know, um, things like nuclear power plants, mm -hmm. aircrafts, um, where sometimes time, very time sensitive decisions and humans sometimes are not exceptionally good at that. Yes. Um, but but there is a potentially a downside to this idea too, right? You know, it's, uh, uh, you know, I'm biased about this. I always feel that humans are the, the weak link <laughs> in any system. Uh, but when you connect a human to a network or or autonomous decision makers, um, computer based autonomous decision makers, there always some uncertainty. Um, I mean, there's sort of a tail effect, right? When when something happens that we haven't really anticipated, I wonder if that if that system actually does well or not. So it, it depends on the system, right? The, you know, as, as they used to teach us, you know, in our introductory programming classes, garbage in, garbage out, right, in your program. So, um, you know, your agent and your artificial intelligence in this context are only going to be as good as the things they, that, that they are capable of handling, whether it has been programmed through some sort of rule-based system or it's learned. Now, obviously one of the issues, or I shouldn't say obviously, but one of the well-known issues associated with machine learning or deep learning, if you're using that in these contexts, and in the context you're talking about, deep learning is more applicable than in my context because of the processing capabilities available. But one of the things that can happen is these systems are only as good as the uh, training data that they've received. And we see a number of uh, situations already in which um, we find these methodologies failing, right? Or I shouldn't say failing, but not necessarily being um, as diverse in their decision-making capabilities as they need to be or adaptable to the uncertain situations. Um, something like a deep learning network is going to need a large number of instances of that thing it hasn't seen before in order to be able to recognize it. Now, there are new techniques being developed, such as few shot or zero shot learning, um, but they're still fairly new. Um, and so it's a little bit unclear how they will be able to adapt to these uncertain situations. And we're investigating those techniques right now for some of our work. Yeah, but, so it's one yeah. You talked about uh, financial decisions, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, somebody in a financial market trying to make a decision. I think that um, there always has to be checks and balances in place, right? Because ultimately you want the human in the loop and the human has to understand the complexity of what's going on, but they're not always going to be able to get all the breadth of the complexity. So can the agent provide some of that? And of course, that's hoping that the agent is not biasing what's being presented. Yes, I want to get you a uh, perspective on this. Um, I think it's called disengagement. So we have this autonomous driving modalities now. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, th there is a situation where the, the automobile doesn't understand what's in front of it. It disengages and helps the human to take over. Mm -hmm. And there's some concern now that that is not going to work because the human is going to lose a lot of the skills. And we, we actually see this in aircraft now. <laughs> aircraft I, I'm been laughing taking... because I've said this for years now. Um, so um, I drive a manual transmission. Very few people <laughs> in this country drive a manual transmission. I we can't have... do it. I can do it. So, <laughs> so I, you know, my point is that, you know, back when I learned to drive in the 80s, Manual transmissions were not that uncommon, um, but automatic transmissions were becoming more prevalent. And we see skill degradation there, right? There's, like you just said, you can't do it, right? And most people today are not taught how to drive a manual transmission. I asked this question in my class the other day, and, and my students from India were the, were the prominent ones raising their hand. <laughs> yeah. I can drive a manual transmission proudly, but they don't drive them here. Um, so, 
you know, that is definitely a concern, and we already see that in a number of areas. I mean, nuclear power plant control is one of those things. When I was doing some research um, at a nuclear power plant um, in the in the simulator, we were collecting some data, and they turned off a particular uh, piece of information um, to the operators. The operators had all the information across the, the uh, control room to be able to calculate that same information, but they no longer had that graph, right? And they, they were being trained to realize that they still had that information and they had to problem solve, right? Um, and the first time it occurred, you know, the, the trainers were telling us that the first time that kind of thing occurred, the operators were unable to figure out how to do that. They had to rebuild that skill. Um, we see the same thing with pilots. You know, pilots have to train, repeat training every year. They have to do manual landing and takeoff every few months in order to maintain those skills. So it is definitely a concern with autonomous driving. I mean, we've already seen a number of incidents where the human driver's vigilance is not there. Um, and so how do we maintain that? And that's, I think, a very difficult question. And we're at this um, kind of intermediary point right now where you still have the human sitting behind a steering wheel because the autonomy is not good enough to do everything on its own. But then you have a vision of the future where the autonomous vehicle is going to be able to handle everything and there won't even be a steering wheel in the car or brake pedals, right? You're just a passenger. So we're still, I think, a very long ways away from that. And recently um, in the various literature and magazines, you're seeing uh, more recognition of the fact that machine learning is not really generating the robust solutions that were anticipated. And now they're having to investigate other solutions that will um, allow the system to adapt to some of these uncertainties that we see. But like today would be a perfect example, right? If you were going from Corvallis, where it's right now sunny, but it was raining earlier, and driving to Portland, where there's a major snowstorm today, you know, that vehicle would really have to adapt um, while driving up I-5. Um, and, you know, I don't think they're very capable of doing that right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a bit, a bit conflicted about this, Judy, so I want to get your perspective on this. So I try to argue like in financial markets, sort of an inverted U curve. In the middle, we can get humans and robots come together to make optimum decisions. But there's a huge downside. So um, if humans start to lose skills, so in physical systems, aircrafts, automobiles, nuclear power plants, um, are, we, are we to a point that we can really have a middle ground? Um, if we're going in this direction, we have to go all the way. We have to remove the human from the process. Uh, do you see it that way? So, so that's a really interesting question. It's very relevant to uh, my class this week because we're talking about robots in the economy. Um, and so um, I don't think that at least in the foreseeable future, we can eliminate the human. Um, and... When I say foreseeable future, I'm thinking maybe not even in my lifetime. Um, wow, okay. You know, I'd like to think that we could in certain domains, and I think we will be able to in certain domains, but those are going to be more well-controlled environments, right? They're going to be um, the types of environments in which they're- like Hospitals, maybe? Hospitals. Aspects of hospitals, not all hospitals, not all tasks within a hospital, right? It's going to be certain types of tasks that we can more reliably um, ensure that the system is able to do, and we have means of validating that capability across different circumstances. Um, at the same time, I also think that the human is still going to have to be involved, but at sort of a higher level of um, you know, some of the more complex cognitive decisions, for example, um, that I don't think uh, we're going to get to in the near term. You know, there's all these projections about when general AI is going to occur and they keep getting pushed back, right? Um, I've been studying AI now for, well, way too long. <laughs> um, and, uh, 
you know, that has been kind of the holy grail of, of a lot of people in, in artificial intelligence. And ultimately robots incorporate lots of artificial intelligence. They're not just, you know, tin cans that can do something. Um, so I think we're still quite a ways away from that. Um, you know, and I think there's also a question of, do we want artificial intelligence to be as good as us or better than us? Because how do we control it? Um, so I think there's lots of different perspectives there. And going back to your question of how do we keep the human engaged? Um, I think it's a matter of understanding for a particular job um, how the agent or the robot is most effective and where it fails. Now, that is not to say that we're going to what's called the Habba Mabba perspective, which is humans are better at, machines are better at. We don't want to go that route. I'm very much against that route because we don't want to just give the machine the things that it's good at. And we don't want to just give the human the things that humans are good at. We need to find um, some cohesive, I hate to use the word synergy because people then sometimes equate that to, you know, humans becoming robotic, which is not the case here, but some synergy there that allows the humans to continue to understand what's going on, but also elevate their skill set um, and keep them engaged and feeling as though their job is a useful contribution. Yeah, I, I wasn't um, going in this direction, Julie, but I want to ask you, so there, there are a lot of ethical concerns in AI. Yep. And there is, uh, I'll get a lot of emails after this, so uh, I'm going to say this anyway. There's a, there's a homocentric view of the world mm -hmm. that humans are somehow better decision makers, superior. Uh, more importantly, there is a view that humans should not let machines take over because they might they might actually do bad things. Humans are doing all sorts of bad things today. I mean, yes, they are. <laughs> why, why, why do you think machines would be any worse? Yeah, so um, the, the class of actually teaching this term is robotics and society. So lots of ethical questions. Um, and our term just started two weeks ago. So, <laughs> but, um, you know, there are definitely cases where humans should not be making decisions. I mean, we already see that, right? Um, machine like politicians, we can easily replace politicians with machines. <laughs> they will be a lot better. I think we can replace some of them. I don't know if we can replace all of them, and I'm not going to name the kinds of positions that I think we can replace, but I do think that uh, we would have less emotion uh, and less, um, less, I don't know, I will stick with emotion <laughs> uh, in the decisions that are being made and the directions that are being taken. But, you know, there are plenty of examples where machines make better decisions faster than humans can. Um, we see that in nuclear power plant control. We see that in aircraft. Um, and we see that in things like the International Space Station, or not Space Station, uh, Space Shuttle, sorry, um, in the Space Shuttle, right? Um, there are times where the control loop in the system is so tight and so fast, humans cannot possibly uh, understand and respond quickly enough. We're just too they're, they're, they're all rules based though, right? They're all rules based. Um yeah, well, those examples probably are rule based, yeah. yeah. Um I, I think you know we're getting to the point where we're gonna see some that are more statistically based yeah. um in the future as well. I mean we're starting to see some of that, right? I mean, we're starting to see in the autonomous cars that you were mentioning, right? A lot of that is machine learning and statistical based decision yeah. making, um, where the car you know if we don't focus on all the bad things that have happened if we focus on the good things the vehicles are able to make decisions faster than a human might um, now when we do talk about autonomous vehicles we do see failures but those failures tend to be what we call edge cases right yeah um and so how do you address those edge cases and, and that's a huge issue within the the ethical concerns of using the technology and the liability associated with using the technology, right? Yeah, I mean, there's an aggregated utility question. I, I don't know exactly what the numbers are, but something like 5,000 people die 
from auto accidents every day or maybe even more. I, I have no clue. Actually, it, it's a pretty large number in the US. Um, and so if you can show that, suppose we replace the system with all autonomous level five modalities and we get 1000 deaths, let's say, instead of 5000. Isn't that better? I mean, people will point to the 997 and say, look, that person died because an autonomous car ran over that person. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, if you look at the actuarial projections, um, there is, uh, there are many models, I think, that show that level five autonomous vehicles will substantially reduce, um, you know, human deaths. Now, I can't give you specific citations for that because I didn't prepare that ahead of time, but I know I've seen that out there. And so, yeah, I think there is an argument that that technology, when it is ready and validated to be safe and secure, and is not going to actually cause more accidents than um, it should, that that is a task, right, that, uh, that maybe is best for for autonomous vehicles, right? Because how much time, and we see articles all the time about how much time people waste driving and commuting, right? Um, now, Corvallis, you don't waste very much time because I get on the bus <laughs> and it takes 10 minutes to get to campus and I'm doing my email on the bus. But, you know, when I lived in Nashville or if you live in LA, you know, your commute times are horrible. And that is time you could be using more effectively, whether that is to be productive for your job or to be doing something more enjoyable, um, you know, something for yourself. Um, so, you know, there is a point where autonomous vehicles, I think, really are a good example of uh, technology where we want to have that autonomous capability. And the human doesn't necessarily have to be in the loop, but we still aren't there yet. So we're in that in between still. Yeah, so you're telling me, Julie, that Corvallis hasn't changed in 30 years. It's about the same. And I was there in the early 1990s. It hasn't become a big city and, you know, no. traffic jams and all that stuff. No, traffic jams. <laughs> That's disappointing. No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so, so I'm going to go into, um, you, you told me this sort of collection of research uh, your students and your colleagues have done uh, human collective collaborative site selection. Mm -hmm. I found this extremely interesting. So robotic collectives, you say, are large groups, more than 50 of locally sensing and communicating robots that encompass characteristics of swarms and colonies whose emergent behaviors accomplish complex tasks. Future human collective teams will extend the ability of operators to monitor, respond, and make decisions in disaster response, search and rescue, and environmental monitoring problems. Um, you say this manuscript evaluates two collective best of decision models for enabling collectives to identify and choose the highest value target from a finite set of targets. So a collective, as you say here, is a large group of more than 50 of locally sensing and communicating things. So it could be robots, it could be honeybees, yeah, it could be anything, right? So yeah. they, they are distinct, they're locally sensing, and they're communicating. That those are the characteristics, right? Right, and they tend to be, um, you know, if you're talking about robots, if you're going to try to scale to say a, a collective of 200 or 500 agents, you know, you are talking about um, embodied agents that have to be on the less expensive side. So what does that mean compared to say the multi-robot systems we were talking about a moment ago? Does mean that these agents um, have cheaper sensing capabilities. So instead of having that seven or $15,000 LIDAR, you now have a $100 LIDAR. Um, instead of having you know, the, the uh, most expensive portable computer you can have, because you are talking about cost and in the case of unmanned aerial vehicles, payload capacity, you're maybe looking at a Jetson processor, right? 
um, which is a great processor. Don't get me wrong. It's much better <laughs> than my robots had in grad school, but it's still not the same thing as what many, many people think of when they think of uh, machine learning or deep learning uh, being applied to problems. So I think it, uh, one key aspect there is re recognizing that these are less capable agents, right? Um, from locally, the perspective- Locally, right? Locally. Well, so That's each it. individual agent is less capable than say a more expensive multi-robot system, but they're also um, distributed and they're locally communicating. What we mean by that is that we're not relying on communication infrastructure to communicate to every agent. And in fact, when we, and all of this work, I should mention, is inspired by the biological entities. So swarms of fish, flocks of birds, colonies of honeybees and ants. Um, and so when we look at those entities, they don't have, a, you know, a communication infrastructure. In fact, when we look at swarms, and this has been proven in the biological literature, that oftentimes the communications going through the swarm can even jump over portions of the swarm and go from one side to the other. So, you know, it tends to be local communications. And um, we call this the perception based model because really it's based on the biology um, and and they call it the, the vision based model, for example, in fish. But because our perceptions on robots can come from different types of sensors, we call it the perception based model. So you are able to communicate or understand what's going on with the entities uh, that you can perceive and you adapt your behavior appropriately. Um, and so you do get what looks like more intelligent behavior from these very simple entities. So a great example, if you go out on Google and you search for videos of, you know, uh, swarms of fish trying to avoid sharks, you'll see lots of different ways that different species of fish will try to um, distract their predators and make it harder for the predator to be able to uh, attack them. So, so that's a key element of, of collectives. In this case. Yeah, so I want to understand a little bit um, of this theory. So, uh, in the case of the fish, the movement I have seen, you know, sort of swarms. I don't know the schools of fish. I guess uh -huh. uh, making a big body, and sometimes it could also be very threatening to a predator because you know it just looks like a uh, one thing in some ways, uh -huh. right? So, in case of honeybees and ants and things like that, how do they actually communicate? Are, are they are they looking at each other's facial expressions? I mean, what, what, what's happening there? <laughs> so in the honeybees, which we've spent the most time studying, and uh, we've worked locally with the honeybee laboratory for some of our work and studied some of the work by others, um, uh, such as Tom Seeley from Cornell, um, you know, the honeybees tend to uh, communicate using their waggle dance. They also have direct interactions. So things like trophallaxis, where they use their tongue to clean the other agents. They may do intonation to communicate information. Still not very well understood um, what things are communicated through intonation and trophallaxis, at least for the areas that we were looking at specifically with the honeybee lab. So is but, there some kind of chemical transmitted in that action? In the intonation, they're just using their antennas to- Yes, the antenna, okay. To, to um touch each other with the trophallaxis they're using their tongues to interact they also groom one another um so for example with the honeybee lab we were looking specifically at a behavior called self-removal so when honeybees become ill or perhaps have um, encountered a contaminant they will remove themselves from the hive in order to protect the hive mm. um, it's not well understood how a bee comes to uh, determine that it needs to self remove itself. And of course, if it removes itself from the hive, it's basically committing suicide um, because it's not going to be able to survive on its own without the hive. But do um, we know it's self removal or forced removal of some sort? It's it's called self removal. Okay. Um, so we did some studies with the honeybee lab to try to understand what behaviors would um, ex would represent that the bee is coming to understand that it should self-remove. And the data was a little mixed. Um, the, the environmental conditions at the time were um, in extreme conditions, so it caused different behaviors in the bees. So it's still a little bit uncertain, but we've gained a little more insight on that. 
We have developed models for self-removal. So why would you want to have a, an agent be able to self-remove itself from the collective? Well, you can imagine that if you have um, a, a swarm of UAVs flying over a city to collect information after, say, a massive earthquake, and someone attempts to infiltrate that swarm and control it um, by putting a virus on it that could spread throughout the swarm and provide false information back to the first responders, you'd like to be able to identify that you've been infected, right? Just like a bee would identify that it's been mm -hmm. infected infected and remove itself. Um, so we have uh, a model that does that. Um, we also have models. Um, so you asked about communication. One of the things that happens when bees return to the uh, hive is that there are guard bees at the entrance to the hive. And those guard bees are using their sense of smell and um, observation of the actions of the incoming agents, as well as um, they can also look at pollen load, for example, um, to determine whether or not a bee is allowed into the hive. Now, each hive has its own um, pheromones, and so um, the pheromones can represent that an age, that a bee belongs to this hive. Um, but also, you can have what's called drifting, where bees will come from different hives, and it can occur for many reasons. Um, but they'll have a different pheromone scent, right? So. Um, the if different times of the year change the bees behavior with regard to allowing that drifter bee into the hive if it's a time of um a lot of pollen you know a lot of food then they're likely to potentially not allow that bee in mm -hmm. if that bee is coming in with a pollen load when there's a dearth of pollen then they're likely to allow that bee in um, and same thing with predators you know, they they those guards are there to protect the hive. So um, we have actually um, implemented models of both guarding and um, drifters. And uh, when we integrate drifters, we have adversarial drifters and non-adversarial drifters. So the drifters are that other honeybee bringing in um, extra pollen to the hive to create more food. And then um, the adversarial drifters could be something like the um, the, the killer hornet, I think it's called, or the killer wasp, whatever it is, the Japanese wasp that they've been trying oh, to take. Yeah. Um, you know, because that that individual is coming in to try to kill all the bees and rob the hive. So um, we've been able to demonstrate that you can get that sort of communication and assessment um, around our artificial hive and our agent system um, by having some guard bees. And that does affect the decision making uh, by the hive. Now you mentioned the best of N, um, the site selection, which is basically a consensus decision making process. Yes. So the bees go out, they investigate the environment. It's a random walk. They don't know where the sites are. They have to assess it. And if you've if you've never looked at how honeybees assess sites for their for their future nests, I absolutely recommend reading some of Tom Seeley's books. Um, it's Honeybees are amazing in what they can do and how they assess these, um, you know, areas in different structures that could potentially be their new nest site. Um, so the agents go out, they do a random walk. When they discover a site, um, they are to come back and um, try to recruit other agents to investigate that site. And they're trying to, to choose the best site with regard to a value, a utility value. Um, so is so it... Uh so sorry, Judy. So yeah. um, it's not consensus, right? It's sort of a majority voting process. So it I'm is. Sure. So um, what happens is the bees try to recruit these the other, sorry, the agents in our implementation attempt to recruit other agents to investigate their sites. Now, in our algorithm, which is differs from some of the um, fundamental algorithms based on honeybees, we actually deal with with, with what's called environmental bias. So in honeybees and in some of the existing other algorithms, um, the closest site that may not have the highest value will be selected. And we've um, developed our algorithm so that it can actually go and, and ensure that we're investigating within the entire area to try to identify the best site. Um, and so what happens is the agents get recruited to investigate these sites. Over time, uh, you gain consensus for the best site 
And once you reach certain thresholds, then you can move to the next stages of being committed and then selecting the site. It does take consensus decision making takes a long time. Um, and yeah. so that's why the human was involved in the process. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so what do you mean by value is, it's sort of some sort of a net present value, meaning um, you have some future expectations of benefits, uh, right. whether it's food or protection or whatever, and there's a cost, right? So the further you are from the new site, there's some cost to um, immigrating there. That's right. Uh, and so are they are they really sort of computing some sort of net present value to determine so what the we're, we're not doing that currently. So we're not considering the cost because um, we are just assuming that we're going to move. So in the spring, um, there will be multiple queens in a hive. And so a subset of the hive will leave and they do have to make uh, a decision, reach consensus on a new hive location um, within a couple of days or they have they run out of food and they're going to die. Mm. They also want to not reach a split decision, meaning they don't want to select two sites because then you're only going to have a portion of the group going with the queen. They're going to live and the other portion is going to die. So you want to to have it select kind of one site that's the best. Um, and so in our implementation, we aren't considering that distance right now. Um, we are only considering the value of the target that's perceived by the robots. I don't know much about honeybees, but why is the queen so necessary for living? Uh, so the queen is necessary for producing the, um, so, so let me step back for a second. Honeybees have about a 14 day life cycle. Oh. And so the queen is necessary for laying eggs um, and so the queen is the, the, the cycle, so yeah, to continue the life cycle. So without the, without the queen, you are sort of done. Yes, so you're done yeah. in fourteen days at the at the best. Approximately four days, fourteen days. Yes, okay. yeah. Um, and so so the, so um, you, you talk about sort of majority voting. Uh, it, it's difficult to reach consensus. Um, you, you talked about sort of the split family or mm -hmm. whatever you want to call split it. Decision. The split decision. Split decision. And if it is truly split, uh, we have seen situations where half the colony goes to X and the other half goes to Y. Um, so we have seen that occur. We, we have put uh, mechanisms in place in our algorithm to try to avoid the split decision. Um, but there are certain circumstances where that can occur. Now, in the paper that you were citing on this work, um, we were the first to kind of integrate the human into this colony-based decision-making process. And one of the reasons originally for doing it was to use the human as a means of ensuring we didn't reach uh, a split decision. Um, and in the case of um, algorithms that don't include this um, mechanism for dealing with um, environmental bias, we also want to make sure that the human is influencing the collective to investigate targets that maybe they wouldn't investigate otherwise. Uh, um, and when I say investigate, what I mean by that is recruit more agents to go to that site to investigate it. Um, because we wouldn't know about the site if it hadn't been found by about 10% of the agents in the hub, in the hive already or the hub already. Yeah. So, um, so, so you're taking this idea from biological systems into, into robotic des designs, right? So uh, before we get there, I, so what is the sort of the, what is the need to shift from one location to another for the honeybees? I mean, what is causing the shift? So for the honeybees or for the agents? For, for, for the honeybees, I just wanted to get that. Okay. So um, the honeybees don't actually have a need to shift. Um, we implemented that because we want to be able to apply these kinds of algorithms to real world problems. Um, so you could imagine, for example, in a, in a, a mass disaster, uh, let's take a wildland fire um, 
I don't remember exactly where you are. Are you in California now? In, in Connecticut. In Connecticut, okay. So um, having moved from the East Coast just a few years ago, um, I have become abundantly aware of the massive wildland fires here and how they differ from what we know as wildland fires in the East. Yeah. Um, and they tend to be in very remote, difficult areas, rough terrain. Um, and at any point in time, for example, in Oregon, you could have dozens of fires going on, but you're only responding to one. Mm. And the reason that's occurring is because that particular fire is the most dangerous. Perhaps it's at the uh, wildland urban interface. So there's the potential for um, people and property to be damaged by the fire, um, things of that nature. And, and you're just monitoring the other fire. So you could imagine that you would use these collectives to monitor the fires along the cascades. And so you would want to potentially deploy them in one region one day, and then you need to kind of investigate, um, you know, what is the, the, the wildfire that potentially is raising up in the priority level. And so you want to relocate to that area to keep monitoring it. Right now, um, there are cameras that are placed in the wilderness to monitor for fires. Um, but they're only in certain locations, they aren't mobile. Um, so you could use this collected to really monitor larger areas and you could adapt in real time. If you see a fire that's potentially becoming more dangerous, you could adapt the collective to really be monitoring that fire um, and, and you wanna to move to that location. Yeah, that's really fascinating. It's sort of, sort of an optimization problem, right? So if I have X square kilometers and I have Y drones, let's say. Uh, I can deploy them in sort of a random fashion across that design space. Mm -hmm. And they start monitoring and they start prioritizing when things go out of whack. They mm -hmm. can assemble a large number of those modalities into a singular focus to take care of that one particular problem, yes. right? Something along yes. those lines. Yes, and I should say the disclaimer here is that we are ignoring the power supply concern that you would have. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares about practical engineering problems? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're talking about, you know, smaller drones, they do have very short uh, power supplies. So, yeah. I mean, we are already designing aircrafts that fly on solar power. So right. I would imagine we are pretty close to get uh, powered Again, it goes to back to that payload issue, right? If you've got, you know, a smaller drone that's, you know, 10 to 15 pounds, um, you know, you only have a couple of pounds of payload, maybe five pounds of payload capacity available. So, yeah, it, it's it's a tricky problem. But in the case of wildfires, would you, wouldn't you sort of um, disassociate decision making from intervention? In other words, what you what you what you want is sort of figure out where intervention is needed. Mm -hmm. So the robotic modalities are about decision making, not necessarily carrying anything. And they just ask, you know, the big aircraft to come. Um, well, so, the so the big aircraft could be asked to come, but if they have a higher priority and they are not authorized to go to that area, they just can't come. <laughs> so it does require more coordination. There's, there is definitely, um, you know, in the the very few years that I've lived in the Pacific Northwest, the number of fires and their intensity have increased dramatically. Yeah. Um, and so you are taking the same resources that you had previously and applying them to much more complicated and difficult situations. And in fact, I just heard on the news that. Um, you know, there's been a large number of wildland fires in Texas this winter. Um, and so I just heard that some of the Oregon responders have actually deployed to Texas to try to help there with a fire uh, near San Antonio. Um, so we are seeing, you know, a lot more um, demand on the humans. Um, and any of the wildland fire responders you will talk to will tell you that the season, which used to be, you know, like July to October, for example, 
is now pretty much year round. And it's a very um, demanding physical um, job. And so the, the, the responders just aren't getting the downtime to train, to build their skills and to recover um, like they have in the past. Yeah, so I want to touch on the sort of decision models you talk about here. Um, I, I didn't really get into the details of this, Julie, but you know, there's sort of a base model and you talk about an extended model, mm -hmm. how the external more algorithm could be uh, more efficient, uh, better. You want to talk a bit about those? Sure. So I've alluded to that a little bit already um, when I was talking about the ecological, um, I'm sorry, the environmental bias. So we're going back to these best, the best site selection algorithms that we were talking about a moment ago. And um, one of the baseline algorithms that we used was developed a few years ago and by a, another research group. And in that particular group, um, their algorithm did not deal with this environmental bias. So what would happen is it would choose a good site, but not the best site. And that good site was closer to the hub. So one of the things, additionally, that particular algorithm uh, takes quite a long time to um, make a decision. And it needs to know where the sites are located prior to beginning to search. So some of the extensions that we made, the first extension was to be able to start the search with no knowledge of the search area in the environment and be able to identify potential sites as they were discovered um, using this random walk process that uh, we talked about a moment ago for our agents. They begin by doing a random walk throughout the search area and then looking for the sites and assessing them and coming back. Um, additionally, we put mechanisms in place to ensure that we are, in fact, uh, attempting to get to that highest valued site that is far away from the hub, but within the search area. So ensuring that we are trying to uh, balance our understanding and um, assessment of the sites in the environment and considering that within the consensus. Additionally, um, we also incorporated mechanisms that allowed us to shorten the time to reach consensus. However, that time is still quite long, and that's why we wanted to investigate how the human may be able to help speed up that process as well. Yeah, I'm really fascinated about this. So um, I would imagine there's a lot of uh, variations in honeybees too. So I can imagine, you know, the agents go out to the design space, they do random walk, they collect information, they come back to the hub, and they say, um, one says, you know, site X is better, two says site Y is better. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the human case, you know, whoever can shout uh, louder, sometimes <laughs> get more attention. <laughs> I don't know what the, what the That is true. <laughs> So how do they actually, I mean, there's no standardization of information exchange here, right? So right. how do they actually standardize this information to reach a decision? So um, what happens, excuse me, is that uh, what, what they're basically doing is they're trying to recruit the mm -hmm. other honeybees to go investigate that other, that site. So if uh, honeybee alpha and honeybee beta have investigated two sites, um, they will come back and they will attempt to recruit other honeybees to go investigate their respective sites. Now, the honeybees that uh, out honeybee beta potentially are interacting with may not have interacted with honeybee alpha. So they don't know anything about hun site, the site that alpha has yeah, found that yeah. has higher value, right? So those honeybees that beta has been recruiting will go out, but when they come back, they may interact with honeybee alpha who can now steal those honeybees and have them go inspect alpha site. So over time, what you see is the number of bees will um, transition to, tend to transition to that higher valued site because the information starts to spread to more bees. And because it is a local direct interaction, as more bees get that information, then they will spread that throughout the hive. Um, so, so that so, is so, so much more intelligent process than humans. Uh, we have half the country watching uh, TVX and half the country watching TVY, 
and they don't talk to each other. They don't, you know, there is there, there is no beta going to alpha and alpha going to beta. Uh, uh, but th this uh, this process appears to be much more intelligent than what we deploy typically. <sighs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> At a very biological level, um, I think you could argue that there are plenty of mechanisms around for humans to interact more and, and to have similar interactions. It's just a matter of whether or not we use those mechanisms to communicate effectively with one another. <laughs> so from a scientific perspective, <laughs> So from a scientific perspective, so so the work here uh, gives you a lot of insights into um, how to deploy swarms of mechanical systems mm -hmm. uh, to reach optimum decisions, right? So uh, can you, is, is it possible from this work to sort of reduce them to a set of insights, heuristics that that are sort of important to consider when, when you design a swarm? When you're talking about heuristics for designing swarm, are you talking about domain specific heuristics? I'm not quite sure I follow. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I'm not uh, talking, I mean, th not thinking about any specific, I mean, let's think about wildfires again, right? So, suppose we have some sort of mechanical systems, you know, uh, deployed to detect, to monitor, detect, prevent, intervene. Um, what are there things that we can learn from the honeybees that will tell us how to sort of think about them? In the case of wildfires, for example? Yeah, so I think the takeaways that, you know, the hardest part of that problem that we were talking about where we're using the collective to monitor all the other wildfires that are not being actively fought um, is how do we develop that sense of value and what is the yeah. highest value, right? Yeah. So that's going to be very dependent upon the capabilities of the robots or the that are being used, right? So what are they using to measure the impact of the fire? Um, and so some of that is going to be the, those heuristics that you're talking about are going to be the similar heuristics to what's used by firefighters or uh, the individuals in charge of making the decision about which wildfire to respond to are part of the pro you know are part of the decision making process. So there, those heuristics exist to some extent, but then we have to be able to translate them into something that's machine understandable, right? So if the human is looking at images of a wildland uh, fire that's being monitored, they may say, okay, it looks like, you know, we know what the weather is doing. We've got the satellite imagery. We can see the area that's being covered. Um, and we know um, some information about what the underbrush is, what the fuel level is. So therefore we need to up our monitoring of this, perhaps we need to actually send personnel out there to monitor what's going on as opposed to relying on the cameras, right? Yes. So we have to be able to uh, adapt some of those same capabilities. And, you know, going back to our conversation earlier about are we at a place where robots can make these decisions autonomously? No, right? So this is that mix of having to have the human involved and having to have that cognitive interpretation by the human. So the, the collective can be best used in this example right now, or not right now, but in the near future when we have yeah, robots yeah. that can actually go do this with power. But um, you know, the, the, the robots can be used to collect important information, right? So yes, we have the weather forecast. Yes, we can see the satellite imagery, but what is the, um, microclimate that's occurring right there. Does it match the winds that we think are predicted for the area or are there high winds that are occurring? Um, does the actual underbrush, the fuel, match what we expect it to match based upon our modeling? You know, it's kind of like weather forecasting. We're only as good as our models and our heuristics. Um, 
Yeah, it's also an economic question, as you say. It's a valuation problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is an economic model question. Um, for instance, suppose it's a utilitarian economic model. Mm -hmm. And I say I would rather kill off 999 than lose 1,000. You read some decision. Mm -hmm. in, a, in a pure utilitarian model, uh, machines do a lot better <laughs> than humans. Right. So this is where I sort of um, get conflicted. When you introduce a human into it, how does she uh, mediate a valuation model that the robots are using? Uh, I, it, it's a complex question. <laughs> yeah. It is a complex question. I think it is very domain dependent and, and how much of the decision making process is driven by, uh, say, regulations and rules, right? So in a, you know, commercial aircraft situation, there are a number of policies and regulations and procedures put into place to try to streamline that decision making, right? Yeah. Whereas in other areas, it's much more subjective. If you are an individual investor trying to decide what stocks to invest in, you know, your criteria are going to be very different than mine. Um, yeah, I'm guessing because <laughs> mine, are, mine are very strict um, of what I will invest in personally, you know. Um, but my decision making process is going to be very different than yours because the value proposition is different to you than it is for me. And, and even for an individual, that value proposition changes over time, right? In theory, as we get older, we should be more risk averse. Um, you know, so when I talk to someone in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, and they're investing in cryptocurrency, well, great <laughs> for them, you know? Don't invest any more than you can afford to lose, you know. Um, and so I might say to myself, OK, well, you know, this crypto thing's kind of interesting. What am I willing to put into it? You know, it's not going to be the major portion of my portfolio. So that's a great example, right, of where the differences are very subjective. And that is very hard to get into robots and artificial intelligence because we as humans are not going to sit there and tell the robot, hey, these are my criteria, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you could right. argue that, yes, it could adapt based upon your strategies over time. But, you know, if you're not an active trader, you're not going to have enough data points to really adapt that well. Yeah, financial markets are probably not a very good application uh, for robotics. Um, it is it is truly geometric Brownian motion, and a lot of lot of people believe they know something, but um, <laughs> sometimes we can make money for a little while, and then you lose it all. So that's <laughs> yes. that, that's that's what we see. But in, in physical systems like the work that you're doing here, we can learn a lot from biological systems. It appears right how they make decisions, how they optimize. And this is where we are heading, I think, right? I mean, uh, you know, nuclear power plants, uh, environmentally sensitive areas, um, uh, space exploration. I mean, we, we are going to be in situations that we have very few humans, but very large number of uh, mechanical modalities, right? So that interaction, I think, is going to be quite quite a crucial thing. To I think one of the I agree with you on that statement. I think one of the criteria is what is the potential benefit or the potential uh, negative outcome of having robots or AI in charge of some of these decisions. You mentioned nuclear power plants, right? Um, it that would be one where I would be a little concerned about not having a human in the loop. Um, you know, while I think that agents and AI and, and robots can can have lots of benefits in those domains, in that particular domain, I also think that the consequences to society if something goes wrong are tremendous, right? So that's a very different set of criteria than if we're sending things to the moon to build a habitat, right? Um, so I think that- We could the, try again. If you fail, we could try again. Yeah. Yeah, it's just an economic question rather than sort of a life question. 
Yep, exactly. But on the other hand, you know, we had this um, aircrafts running around which are autonomous flying machines. We have had them for 30, 40 years now. And most of the, uh, I don't know, I can say most of them, but a large percentage of the failures of aircrafts are human, human errors. Yep. And so you have to wonder um, if human is adding a lot <laughs> to the process. Yeah, so if you look at the literature, um, you know, it, it is true that the primary source of aviation accidents is human caused. Um, I don't want to necessarily say it's error because it could be the correct reaction. Um, it's also sometimes, um, you know, they just kind of narrowing in on what they think the problem is, but they don't have all the information, um, you know, and that that's exactly what uh, transpired with. Oh, shoot. I just I want to say Chernobyl because that's on the top of my brain because of current events. But um, well, the, the Japanese Three Mile Island, Three Mile oh, Island, Island yeah. right? Um, it's been shown that, you know, because of certain situations uh, with a printer, the operators were led in in the wrong direction or didn't have the current information in order to inform their decisions, right? Um, and we see this happen often, right? That you just get narrow, you get focused in on something and you can't see the other information or you have confirmation bias. So whatever you're seeing is just confirming what you thought originally and you're not open to uh, potential other issues. So yeah, that is, that's definitely an issue. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a really, uh, really interesting work. Uh, um, so it seems like we cannot stop here. I mean, we are on a track that we are heading in this direction. There will be less, it appears to be less human involvement and more machine involvement in decisions in the future. Mm -hmm. So the real question I think you're trying to answer here is what is sort of the optimum combination of human machine? that gives us the best outcomes, right? Yes, and that's a tricky question, right? Because in certain types of systems, you are going to have national or international standards and regulations that will influence um, what the systems are capable of doing. However, in other circumstances, you may not. Um, and so, you know, I think the, the question is, how do we go forward with this, right? Um, I, a couple of years ago in my human robot interaction class, we were talking about autonomous vehicles, but not from the perspective of the rider, but from the perspective of the pedestrian or the bicycle rider or the motorcycle rider and how those individuals, especially when you consider um, individuals with cognitive, visual, auditory disorders, or even younger children can identify what an autonomous vehicle is doing when they come up to a stop sign or a, a light and such, right? Um, and in that context, you know, you you start to think about, well, you know, human drivers have to have their license renewed, right? They have to have proven that they can actually deserve a license and earn a license, right? Now, there isn't retraining of that. Um, but how do we identify that the vehicles have some sort of license that they can communicate, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> um, and that impacts, you know, that goes to the regulations, right, of what is required. So I think there's this question of how do you build confidence? And I'm going to avoid purposely the word trust because that brings up a whole nother set of issues. But how do you build confidence given the context that the robot is in for the human to understand what it's doing and take appropriate action and not interfere. I mean, from my own research, you know, and, and this has been proven as well in the human factors literature with lots of different types of systems that when someone is not as confident in the system, they tend to intervene more and actually cause it to perform worse. Yeah, yeah. Right. So how do you mitigate that? 
Yeah, sort of a cultural regime change in the sense that uh, you talked about pedestrians, motorbikes, um, bicycle riders. So safety is not just for the car and the driver. It's the safety of the context that needs to be proven, right? Yep. Which is a much larger question. Um, I don't know if, if autonomous um, software makers actually do that systematically. Well, and the other question becomes when that vehicle, um, you know, has indicated that it's going to stop. So the pedestrian starts, it goes into the crosswalk and starts crossing, but then the vehicle doesn't stop. Who's liable? Right. right. Uh, with human drivers, we know who's liable. But, you know, it goes to this question of, is it the manufacturer? Is it, does it go all the way down to the implementer of the software? I mean, we've seen similar incidences or similar, um, I don't want to say incidences, similar um, questions arise out of things like the 737 MAX situation, yeah. Yeah. right? Um, you know, the, the issues associated with space shuttles that have caused accidents, you know, and you can go back and after they've done all the research to identify what the problems were, you know, it goes down to different levels of who's responsible. Um, that's going to be tricky in a lot of these situations with robots, especially if you start thinking about robots in a healthcare situation, um, be it in a hospital, a doctor's office, or even um, in a home, right? Um, I'd say in a home, you have less ability to understand what's causing the system to malfunction. All you got to do is look at videos of cats on Roombas when they first, or, you know, <laughs> with Roombas when Roombas first came out to find out that there's all different kinds of environmental aspects that can impact uh, the responses of robots and any AI agent for that matter. Yeah, but I don't think we have any, any way to turn back. Um, I think we have gone further enough that yeah. uh, so ethics, regulatory frameworks, as you say, um, it's very messy. <laughs> it, seems it, it is very messy. Yeah. And, you know, uh, when I first started working in AI and robotics, we you didn't hear the conversations about ethics and liability that you hear today. And I would say over the last 15 years or so, that has become a much more prevalent um, aspect of the conversation. You see robotics programs and AI programs having uh, huge ethical components, not only to the research they do, but also in their coursework and the expectations of their students. And um, both our you know, OSU's um, robotics graduate program and our new artificial intelligence graduate program, we have required expectations that students um, understand the societal impacts of their work. Um, and the broader implication of what they're doing because they are going to have to um, make these kinds of decisions as they go forward. And sometimes our own inherent biases end up in our robots, right? So right. how do you correct for that? Um, yeah. Yeah, so we'll create robots in our own image, so to speak, <laughs> uh, in the future. <laughs> yes. Um, have, you heard, have you seen um, Hiroshi Ishiguro's uh, robot of himself? No. Oh, I recommend looking it up. Um, he basically created a robot that looks exactly like him and has <laughs> mannerisms. And it's a little, it's, it's, it can be pretty uncanny valley um, for, for many people. So, but he did that quite a while ago, about 15 years ago. Excellent. Yeah, this has been great, Judy. Thanks so much for spending time with me. You're welcome. I enjoyed it. Um, and I guess... You know, lots of interesting problems to consider. Lots of interesting problems. So even after the pandemic ends, uh, we will still have interesting problems to solve. Yeah. I, well, this is one of the reasons, you know, people ask me why I moved from industry back to academia. And one of the reasons is, is I like hard, interesting problems. And in, in computer science and specifically robotics and artificial intelligence, there's always more problems to solve. They're always harder. Even though we haven't solved all the easier problems, there's still more interesting, harder problems that for us to be excited to work on. So, unless, as NASA says, uh, extraterrestrials lands and tells us all the solutions one day, then you know, uh, we'll solve it, it all. Uh, I don't know if that will happen, but 
Um, you know, I, I don't know that even if you took the globe as a collective that we could solve all the problems that we have. <laughs> no, the, the, we seldom solve any problems, actually. I mean, we sort of incrementally move it forward, but solutions that's, have been very difficult. Yeah, yeah that's right. I mean, you do see over time certain things that definite are definite enablers. I mean, in, in robotics especially, I mean, all you have to do is look at the changes in sensors and the increase in computational capability from when the first um, iPhone came out, right? I mean, that that technology that transitioned us to smartphones has really um, done many great things for robotics. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, mechanisms such as deep learning have really kind of advanced machine learning, if you will. Um, and so there are times where you see these these big steps, um, but a lot of the time it's incremental. And, you know, I don't think there's. I don't think there's silver bullet for just about anything, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. excellent. Yeah, thanks so much for spending time with me, Julie. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Bye.